what an attacker would do to completely compromise the system is what's referred to as remote code execution. So what does that actually look like? Well, here you've got your attacker and you'll have a vulnerable application. In our case, we were looking at an HTTP server called Minishare. The reason that I like to target Minishare, there's a really good write-up on a, if, if you do a Google search for Gray Corner blog, there's a security researcher, I think he's out of Australia, that is probably made about, I'd say 20 good blog posts, maybe more, on reverse engineering. And one of the things that he does is his first blog post is walk you through a traditional stack-based buffer overflow. So you can download Minishare, you can tie it to Ollie Debug, you can download Metasploit for free. It's already included in Kali Linux, but you could you know, install it anywhere. With those three components, just Metasploit, Minishare, and Ollie Debug, you can, and you'll need Python as well, um, you can get a feel for creating arbitrary HTTP requests to a remote HTTP server. The reason that I think this is interesting is because it's really on Rails. It guides you through the process of going from, you know, just the discovery of the buffer overflow all the way to execution. And it really does a nice job of stepping you through it. Um, once you understand that, you could target the web interface of anything. And think about it. In your environment, what type of devices have web interfaces? Obviously, there's servers that could have a web interface, but we use web interfaces for more than just hosting our website, right? What types of devices do you guys have in your organizations that have an HTTP interface? And this is an opportunity for everybody to chip in. Servers, printers, your firewall, routers, everything. How about your network management station? HTTP interface. How about if you're doing anything with private cloud and you've got some type of cloud provisioning portal? I'll put cloud and infrastructure as a service. Um, your websites, which could be used for any number of functions, right? Just traditional websites. We've got printers. How about your logging servers? How about your security incident and event managers? IP cameras. The list goes on and on. Even your VoIP endpoints. Good one, Henry. And this is probably something not a lot of folks are looking at. Your, your voice over IP phones, a lot of them, at least the Cisco ones I know, are going to have a web interface that you can interact with. Well, how secure do you think the web interface is on your printer or on your IP camera or on your badge reader or on any other device that you're going to want to manage? The web interface for your you know Hughes lighting controller not at all right they just wanted to build something really really simple to give you a GUI front end to manage it so if you understand the mini share tutorial you could take Python you could open a socket you can connect to a remote servers service and you can do lots of different web requests so you could look at walkthroughs for how to compromise different type of HTTP servers even old walkthroughs and the same types of techniques that they're using are true today. When we look at most of these products, they're typically all built on a Linux TCP IP stack. Most of them are going to be 32-bit based. Some of them are going to be based, and that's 32-bit x86. But when we start looking at things like the Internet of Things, we're going to have ARM. So the reason that I go to that is I go, OK, well, Linux, easy enough. Exploitation Linux systems is something that's well documented. We can find lots of books on. Well, one of the first things we talked about last week, I guess the week before last, when we were looking at reconnaissance, was being able to identify the remote system's architecture. Do you guys remember that? We said we want to figure out what IP addresses are alive, the services that are running, and we'd like to get an idea of the architecture. Is it Windows? Is it Linux? Is it 32-bit? Is it 64-bit? All this helps us out, but why do we care about the architecture? We say that we want to discover it, but why does it really matter? Isn't HTTP a standard? If I'm talking to a Windows web server or a Linux web server, why would I care?
I'm just giving some time for answers to come in. Need to know what services to exploit. Hosting exploits are different based on architecture. Okay, well, what it really is, it's gonna be the assembly code, the actual op code that we're gonna shove into memory on that remote system. You know how when you get a program that works for Windows, I can't copy that program over to a Linux system and run it, not without Wine or some type of emulator. So what's gonna happen with this buffer overflow, once again, you've got the buffer. What we wanna do is stick our own code, our program, in memory on the remote system. And when we do that, what we're sending across is called shellcode. This is what we saw yesterday. Remember, it was just a bunch of bytes. It started off with an X, which is short for zero X, and it might be B1, and you'd see zero X, FA, zero X, B3, zero X, 24, etc. When we take this shell code and we shove it into memory, what we're trying to do is take that instruction pointer. Remember, there were three registers that we wanted to know for 32-bit processors. The base, the stack, and the instruction. There's more than this, but these are the three that are kind of essential to understanding to, to follow what we're doing. What we're hoping to do is fill the buffer, put our own shell code into memory, and steer the instruction pointer to the first byte of shell code. Now, if I can't calculate the exact memory address that it's going to land in, and it's going to be a little bit of a range, what did I preface my shell code with? And I said, this is kind of like a landing pad for your instruction pointer. Anybody remember this? Perfect, that was your NOP sled, or your NOP slide. I say NOP sled. Um, and this is where it would be like X90, 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 X90. And the NOP is just kind of like a go to next, go to next, go to next. So if the instruction pointer lands here, it gets fed to each no op, which eventually flows into our shell code, which will do something on that remote system. So, where are all the pieces? How does this come together? Well, once upon a time, you know, prior to Metasploit, what used to happen is you'd get um, exploit code from the internet. Um, maybe you get it from full disclosure. It's one of the mailing lists where people would just dump security vulnerabilities, um, sometimes without checking with the manufacturer first and saying, hey, I found a bug in a program. It works like this. Here's the code to do it. And they'll call it proof of concept code, or you'll see the acronym POC. And it'll just be like a C program. And everything is in there. It should work right off the bat. But what it does in terms of performing a buffer overflow and shoving code in, not, um, let's step back. When you get a pre-built exploit from the internet, you know, this is prior to Metasploit, this was the only way to get it. Uh, the shell code that was included sometimes wouldn't be that reliable where the activity that you're actually performing on that remote system that you compromise will vary. So for example, um, one of the things that used to be kind of common to run is you'd have shell code that was fairly reliable and it would create a user account of X with a password of X on the remote system. That was all that it did. So I could run an exploit, it would attack a specific, let's say FTP server, and when the exploit ran successfully, it would just create a user account. Well, maybe I couldn't get into that system remotely. Maybe I didn't have a remote desktop. Maybe I didn't have access to an FTP service. So that particular payload didn't really help me. 